Beyond the jungle mountains of central Laos lies a megalithic mystery that has confounded locals and visitors for centuries. The Plain of Jars is probably one of Southeast Asia's biggest enigmas in terms of archaeology. Some say they're the giant's teacups. Some say they're for rice wine. Who built the sites? Where did they live? What was their purpose? For decades, the danger of unexploded bombs has made exploration here risky. Now a team of archaeologists from Australia is using drone technology and virtual tools to dig for answers remotely. It's so cool, the resolution's amazing. This is an incredible tool because it actually allows you to visit the site again. It helps us with our archaeological research, but it also builds a lasting digital record of how the site is at a certain point in time. Getting to the Plain of Jars in central Laos is an adventure in itself. From Luang Prabang, it's a long, bumpy journey to the province of Jing Kwong. But for intrepid archaeologists and their students, the real adventure starts here. The Plain of Jars is fantastic to see. You see hectares of these monumental jars that vary in height, some two to three metres wide, they are ginormous. And we don't know how they got to their resting place. It's possible that they were transported on log rollers, or some have suggested that as they were spherical or round in shape, that they were perhaps rolled to the site. So it's another question that is unanswered as yet. Dr. Louise Schuen and Dr. Dougald O'Reilly have been scouring the landscape for clues in a joint project between Australian universities and the Laos government. There's over 80 sites throughout central Laos and they were first investigated by a woman named Madeleine Kalani back in the 1930s. Most of the sites are actually found on mountaintops, but one of the largest sites is Site 1, and that's where most of the tourists go, so it's called the Plain of Jars for that reason. And this is the first really large uh, research effort to expose the mysteries behind these enigmatic megalithic jars. A small number of sites have been cleared of bombs, and it was in one of these sites that the team made a sobering discovery. The plane of jars was used for human burial. What we've discovered is different types of mortuary behaviour, and that's incredibly exciting. We have the full skeleton of, we believe, a female with a child of about seven buried together. We also discovered buried jars beneath the surface, ceramic jars and within some of those jars were the remains of infants. In Southeast Asia, most of the burial sites are supine burials, so people are buried stretched out, surrounded by a wealth of grave goods. So these sites are quite different in many ways because they are bundled burials, there is not a huge amount of grave goods, and it's something that we want to investigate more. But who built these unusual burial sites? And why? Where did these mysterious people come from and live? Louise hopes to discover more about their movements by studying the isotopic signatures in their teeth. Ideally, we'll be selecting molar one, two and three. We know these mineralise at different stages during childhood, so we can get a signature from where a person's obtained their food from naught years to roughly 16. Drilling down into the data will help determine where these ancient people came from. But Laos's more recent history has also led the team to look at the site from a different perspective. From 1964 to 1973, over 270 million cluster bombs rained down on Laos, 
as part of a US campaign to halt the spread of communism through Indochina. 30% of these bombs didn't explode on impact. And over 40 years later, their presence continues to devastate. So of the 30% unexploded, there's something like 80 million bombs that are still there on the surface or just below. Using well-trodden paths or enlisting local people is the way to go there because they know the safe pathways. But it isn't uncommon to see uh, these bombies on the ground. The use of drones is critically important to us because we can look at even a cleared site and we can survey it with the drone, but often the adjacent quarry site isn't cleared, so we can at least fly the drones over the quarry site and get an understanding of what's there. Back in the safety of their workstation at Monash University, Louise and geologist Steve Micklethwaite are creating a 3D model from drone photos. But it looks like that's the burial. It looks like you can just see the top of the skull. Allowing them to explore sites remotely and securely. We upload a whole bunch of photographs into the software and then the software will start to identify pixels that are of a particular object that it can see in several photographs at once. So you end up generating a 3D point cloud of pixels floating in space. If I zoom right in, you can see each individual pixel. And there's also little blue squares, and those blue squares represent the position that the drone was at when it was taking photographs. And then I'm going to show you the model once it's been densified. This image now, you're looking at the 3D model as a textured wireframe. It's very photorealistic. With the modeling done, it's time for Dougald and Louise to enter the Monash Cave 2, an immersive 3D facility which transports them back into the pit to continue their dig virtually. Wow. Oh, that's great. Yeah, it's yeah. inside. So that's interesting. Like, look at this popping out of the wall, potential further mortuary markers in the limestone here. Yeah. Then that line again all around with the sandstone chips. Yeah, that chip layer again, yeah. Yeah. about 10 centimetres down, but we'll need to check if that's consistent across the sides. See, obviously, this technology allows us to compare at a macro scale the different types of site, the distribution of the jars. There is a lot of different angles that you can use to approach the data. And Cave 2 also has a few tricks of its own to create new data. I think it brings a whole new set of tools that are coupled to the technology to capture the site and then visualise it in here. For example, we can colour the terrain according to altitude. And if you have new tools and new ways of looking at data, then you have new ways of making discoveries. Right there. Isn't that? You can see teeth. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> the team hopes using it's virtual nice. reality yeah. as a digital record and archiving tool will win the Plane of Jars UNESCO World Heritage status. Logistically speaking, there's a lot to do. And they've got even more ambitious plans for their next big dig in mountainous terrain. At Site 52, it's mostly canopied with tree cover, so the drone, in its normal sense, wouldn't be very useful. And that's where this understated-looking prototype holds extraordinary promise. Calvin and, and his professor, who I'm Chung, have designed this drone to be able to fly autonomously and not collide into the walls. And it's going to be collecting data from the tunnel wall. You'll see the objects coming up in real time on the computer screen. So it's effectively building up the 3D image of this tunnel as it goes. We're wanting to take drones a step forward. We want to not only fly them to collect pretty images, but we also want to be able to get them flying without any human being piloting them, maybe getting lots of them flying at once, and critically, get them collecting the data and analysing the data as they go. Currently, helicopters mounted with LiDAR are used to reveal what lies beneath jungle-covered sites, such as the magnificent Cambodian ruins of Angkor Wat, to startling effect. 
Using drones to fly over and under the canopy while analysing the data in real time would be a game changer. With the use of drones, we could probably access all of the sites. So that's uh, 80 plus sites in Laos. You can use this technology for mapping and data interpretation. You can look at uh, transportation of the jars. So in essence, we could eventually see something like drag marks where the jars have been brought from the quarry areas. We'll also use the drones to look for habitation areas because we don't know where the people lived. So we'll be looking for a mound, perhaps, or ceramic scatters, and then we'll investigate further. Oh, here's our the soil samples, yeah. And in time, this new technology could help solve the megalithic mystery of the jars and the people who made them. We're hoping that we can contribute to the Lao people understanding where the jars came from and who created them, because they're an important part of Lao heritage. Um, but also the rest of the world, um, I think, would like to know a little bit more about what was going on in central Laos. Everybody does love a good mystery, but every good mystery has to have a, a solution at the end.